I'm Amy Ng, curator at the Frick Collection in New York, and welcome to another episode of Travels with a Curator. In this episode, we're going to go in a slightly different direction than usual, about 5,000 miles west of New York City to wonderful Honolulu, Hawaii. And if you can tear yourself away from the glorious beaches, I encourage you to go into, into Honolulu and spend a little bit of time at the Honolulu Museum of Art. This is a museum which, like the Frick Collection, was founded on a private collection of a single individual. And in fact, it opened before the Frick Collection. Uh, the Honolulu Museum of Art opened as the Honolulu Academy of Art in 1927. And that is eight years earlier than the Frick Collection opened to the public in 1935. Uh, Honolulu, as many of you know, is on the island of Oahu, which on this map is in the center, sort of the third uh, from the left of the large, the, the eight major large islands. Um, it's to the right of the larger gap of water that separates Kauai in the left-hand corner, upper corner, uh, from Oahu. Um, and this is a map from 1855, published in New York City. And as you can see from the text, if you can read it in the upper right corner, it says Hawaiian group or Sandwich Islands. And for many uh, Europeans and Americans, for some amount of time, Hawaii was known as the Sandwich Islands. And that is because when Captain James Cook arrived in Hawaii in 1778, he was believed to be the first European to land in Hawaii. Um, this was the second of his three famous expeditions where he was going around discovering new places and naming them. Of course, most of those places were already inhabited by people and already had their names. Um, when Cook landed here in 1778, he called this the Sandwich Islands after this man, uh, John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. Yes, this is purportedly the man who invented the sandwich as we know it today, that is meat between two slices of bread. Um, he was also though the first Lord of the Admiralty. And in that role, he, for all intents and purposes, uh, funded the three expeditions of Captain Cook. This portrait of the Earl of Sandwich was painted by Thomas Gainsborough uh, and is at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England. And it was painted in 1783. That is a few years after Captain Cook was killed in Hawaii. It turns out that Cook returned to Hawaii a year after his initial arrival. And after a series of complicated events, uh, which resulted in a, a conflict with the native Hawaiians, which who otherwise were extremely accommodating and hospitable, Cook was killed in Keala Kekua Bay uh, in the large island, the big island of Hawaii in the lower right-hand corner. Um, by the 1840s, the group of islands was becoming less known as the Sandwich Islands and more as Hawaii, and that is the name of its biggest island there on the lower right corner. The years after Cook's arrival and death in Hawaii uh, inaugurated a pretty uh, tumultuous century for the Hawaiian islands and the Hawaiian people. Um, for the most part, the islands were individually ruled by ind individual dynasties, uh, which did compete with each other um, and had conflicts with each other. In 1810, King Kamehameha unified all of the Hawaiian islands under uh, one kingdom of Hawaii. So he conquered the other islands and subjugated all of the Hawaiian people under the first kingdom of Hawaii. He was the first monarch of this kingdom, 1810. And this is a monument to a sculpture of uh, King Kamehameha, which was produced later in the 19th century by an American sculptor, Thomas Gould. It was installed and is installed in front of the Supreme Court building in Honolulu. The monarchy of the Kingdom of Hawaii lasted only 83 years. So if King Kamehameha was the first, the last was Queen Liliuokalani. And this is a photograph of Liliuokalani taken around 1887 in England. She had gone to England to attend the celebrations of Queen Victoria's uh, Golden Jubilee. She was, uh, Liliuokalani was uh, overthrown uh, from and her government was overthrown in 1893 by a group of Americans. Uh, and she was in fact uh, imprisoned in her own palace at I Iolani Palace. Uh, and a few years later, uh, 1898, Hawaii was annexed as a territory of the United States 
and by 1959 became the 50th state of the United States. And of course, that means the 50th star on the new Star Spangled Banner. Uh, in 1993, US Congress apologized to the Hawaiian people for the illegal overthrow of this government under Queen Liliuokalani. Through the 19th century, an enormous number and, and a diversity of number of immigrants came to Hawaii from all over Asia, but also from America and Europe. And the relationship with Europeans and Americans was, of course, a very complicated one. Missionaries from England, primarily in America, uh, began coming to Hawaii in the 1820s. And obviously with the sole purpose of converting the Hawaiian people and those in Hawaii um, to Christianity and in doing so suppressing Hawaiian culture and language. But as I said, it was complicated to a degree because the royal family embraced the missionary families from Europe and from America, intermarrying to some degree and also sending the royal children to missionary schools. So Queen Liliuokalani was educated at a missionary school. So there was a strong bond between the Hawaiian royal family and the missionary families. This is the background against which the founding of the Honolulu Academy of Art in 1927 should be seen. The founder of the Honolulu Academy of Art was Anna Rice Cook. She was the daughter of a prominent missionary family and she married at Charles Montague Cook, who was also from a prominent missionary family in Hawaii um, and who rose to great power and uh, accumulated great wealth in Hawaii um, as an American who also fought to um, have American control over the islands. She, as a widow in the 1920s, decided to uh, donate her personal collection of art, about 4,500 objects, as well as her home and the land uh, of her home in order to found this museum. Uh, and her ideal was that this museum was devoted to the children of Hawaii. From so many diverse backgrounds, she wanted a place for these kids who hailed from many different places to learn about their own cultures from the places that they came from and the cultures of each other, as well as the culture of Hawaii. The house that, that the Cooks lived in on Baratania Street is this one, and it was demolished in order to construct a purpose-built museum uh, for this growing collection, the Honolulu Academy of Art. Um, and she enlisted uh, American architect, uh, Bertram Goodhue, who passed away halfway through the project and Hardy Phillip took over. And the idea was a building that was Hawaiian in, in the way that it integrated different cultures and different uh, forms of architecture, including Chinese uh, aspects, uh, Spanish Mediterranean aspects, as well as Hawaiian aspects. Um, and, and there was some ideal of integrating this into the, the very terrain of Hawaii. Um, a, a beautiful passage describes how this building for the Honolulu Academy of Art did not need a tower because it had Hawaii's mountains. It didn't need bold color because it had Hawaii's flowers. Uh, and it's a building that is organized around a series of courtyards really integrating the building with a very unique place in the Hawaiian Islands in Honolulu. This is a view into the central courtyard. There is a Mediterranean courtyard around which the European art galleries are situated and organized and a Chinese courtyard around which the Asian art galleries are organized. The collection of Asian art is very, very strong. It's, it's uh, particularly renowned for its Asian art collection as well as its Hawaiian art collection. In terms of uh, works of art that are similar or have relations, relationships to objects in the Frick collection, there, it might be surprising to some visitors that there, is, uh, there are a number of strong Italian Renaissance works at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Among them, for example, this Piero di Cosimo painting of uh, St. John the Evangelist. Uh, Piero di Cosimo known uh, primarily for you know, witty sort of quirky narrative scenes here, much more lyrical, much more romantic side in this depiction of the young saint. And to me, an astounding uh, trompe l'oeil depiction of the chalice, just 
coming off of the edge of that fictive uh, frame. Uh, this picture uh, and the group of Italian pictures are actually part of the Samuel H. Crest collection, which in the 1950s distributed a number of Italian works around the United States to so-called regional museums and university museums in order, to, in order to bolster the study of and interest of Italian art in these places. Another crest picture is this wonderful portrait by Giovanni Battista Moroni. Uh, some of you will remember that the Frick hosted a major exhibition uh, on Moroni in 2019. Um, and this is a fantastic example of uh, Moroni's paintings, especially the sort of lifelikeness of the sitter and all of the aspects of costume, including the needlework on the, the collar, uh, this wonderful letter that's just about to fall off of this table, and that very carefully observed hand holding a folded letter. Uh, one of my favorite paintings at the Honolulu Museum is this portrait uh, by John Singer Sargent of Mrs. Thomas Lincoln Manson Jr. So Henry Clay Frick always wanted a painting, a portrait by Sargent, but he was never able to get one. Um, and this was a painting that apparently was a gift from Sargent the artist to the sitter, Mrs. Manson, in thanks for having hosted the artist Sargent in New York uh, when he stayed there around 1891. And that was well before Henry Clay Frick uh, arrived and moved to New York City. But the closest connection between the Honolulu Museum of Arts holdings in European and American art and the Frick uh, belongs in the realm of Whistler. And Whistler is the artist that Henry Clay Frick collected the most number of works by. Um, and among them are these four fabulous uh, full length portraits. Many of you will have happy memories seeing uh, these four Whistler paintings uh, in the Oval Room of the Frick Collection. Uh, they span a, a large part of the artist's career. The uh, earlier two, Mrs. Leyland and Rosa Corder of the 1870s when his Whistler is very, very fashionable. Uh, the later one of the early 1890s of Robert Montesquieu, when again, Whistler is very fashionable. There's a, there's a gap in between in the early 1880s when Whistler is having a very tough time. Um, at the end of the, 70, of the 1870s, uh, the critic John Ruskin criticizes uh, Whistler's painting rather violently and Whistler sues him for libel. And this becomes a very scandalous court case, which Whistler ends up winning, but it bankrupts him in the process. And it scandalizes him almost to the point where he has to leave the country. And he does go off to Venice around this time. When he comes back to England in the early 1880s, it is said that nobody wants to touch him. None of his previous patrons will come near him. Nobody wants to sit for him. And as one scholar put it, the only people who would approach Whistler when he came back to England in the early 1880s were people with no status to lose. Enter Lady Muse, born Valerie Susan Langdon, or so she said. Um, she was purportedly a bartender, uh, rumored to be a prostitute, um, not, you know, not considered of the higher classes of British society at the time, but she meets and marries uh, Sir Henry Bruce Muse, uh, a very wealthy brewer who becomes third baronet. Uh, she is the first to commission from Whistler a portrait, and she doesn't uh, in the early 1880s when he comes back from Venice, and she doesn't commission just one. She commissions three, maybe four, even. Um, and in addition to the one at the Frick, which to me is marvelous for its witness of Whistler's touch. It's called Harmony in Pink and Gray. And you can see where that the subtleties and nuances of those hues are placed side by side. Um, Henry James, uh, by the way, did not approve of this painting. He, he thought that the hat doesn't, didn't fit her very well. In addition to the painting at the Frick, uh, another portrait that Whistler painted of Lady Muse uh, is, is, was destroyed by the artist, apparently after conflict with Lady Muse, um, and he never finished it. Here's a photograph of it, um, of Lady Muse wearing her furs. Uh, there was talk of a, another portrait that he never started of Lady Muse in writing habit. So clearly there was a sense of a series of um, portraits of her. It would have been wonderful to see those all together. But the very first, the very first portrait that Lady Muse commissions from Whistler when he comes back to England from his scandal was this one. 
and it's at the Honolulu Museum of Art. This is the arrangement in black and it is an audacious painting. There's no way that a photograph can capture the blacks in this painting, the textures of them, the way they are layered, the way they look together. Um, it is a, a magnificent picture that really has to be seen in person and, and for a while, to be studied for a while. Uh, it was said that just after they got married, uh, her husband, Lady Mia's husband, purchased some 10,000 pounds worth of uh, jewelry for her. And it seems that she's wearing a lot of it here. Uh, diamond studded tiara, earring, diamond necklace, uh, diamond bracelets that are set off so fabulously against that black glove, which itself is set off against this cloud of the white fur of her mantle. And that mantle also creates a much more slender silhouette than she ever would have um, on her own. Uh, and one of my favorite details, of course, is the lining just sitting on the floor, that squiggle of white, like, uh, like white frosting oozing out from under a fallen cake. Fantastic portrait. Uh, if Lady Muse was not accepted, if she was found vulgar, if she was found nouveau, riche, all of the, the horrible criticisms uh, that she was given by both her in-laws and British society at large, she doesn't seem to care very much in this painting. Uh, the picture from Honolulu was uh, united with the uh, other surviving portrait of Lady Muse at the Frick Collection in 2003 for an exhibition called Whistler, Women and Fashion. How did the first portrait by Whistler of Lady Muse end up in Honolulu? Well, it was purchased by the museum in 1967 from the heirs of Lady Muse, but these were not the heirs that one might expect. So they were not related to her or her husband's family. She did not have children of her own. And when she died in 1910, she was already a widow. And she made it very clear in her will that she was not very happy with the way that she was treated by her husband's family. Um, and it states explicitly that because they did not accept her, they don't, did not respect her, that she was not going to leave the fortune to members of the family. Instead, she chose her own heir. And this was a, a man that she did not know very well. He was a man called Hedworth Lambton. He was considered a British war hero and he lived somewhat nearby with his wife. Uh, and uh, according to one story, he was very kind to her one day at a race course, at a social event where everybody else was ignoring her, boy boycotting her. She was said to be very eccentric and flamboyant and nobody would talk to her, but uh, Mr. Lampton did. Um, and for this kindness, she chose him and for his military uh, accomplishments, she chose him as her heir on the condition that he changed his surname to Muse, which he promptly did. And he uh, inherited the portraits of, of her by Whistler as well as the, the fortune. Um, and it was through his heirs that the Honolulu Museum acquired this painting later on. So it turns out that the story is about two women, Lady Muse and Anna Rice Cook, who shaped their own legacies in their, their own ways. In 2011, the Honolulu Academy of Art and the Contemporary Art Museum in Honolulu joined together. And uh, this combination, this enlargement of the in, uh, institution uh, caused a renaming of the institution as the Honolulu Museum of Art. Uh, this goes hand in hand, this evolution of the museum goes hand in hand with the vision that Anna Rice Cook had set out for this museum that she founded. She wanted it to be a place that was not just a repository for art objects, that was a place for people to walk into and just see objects that had been accumulated, never changing. She wanted it to, to be a place of constant change. Uh, that stories would continue to be told and retold in different ways, showing different objects, the entire institution evolving over time. Uh, it's a little bit like Hawaii itself. And so the next time that you go to the Honolulu Museum of Art, it will tell you different stories. And I look forward to the next time I can get there again and to see and hear the stories that it will tell me. In the meantime, I wish you a very happy summer and uh, thank you for tuning in to Travels with the Curator. See you next time.